Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of A Spot of Science. I'm Gus. I'm Chris. And I'm Sally. This episode of A Spot of Science is brought to you by Blue Apron. Not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients make a real difference, so it's important to know where your food comes from. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. You can choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Customize your recipes each week based on your preferences. Blue Apron has several delivery options so you can choose what fits your needs. And there's no weekly commitment so you only get deliveries when you want them. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash spot of science. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash spot of science. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Let's dive into it. Our first question comes from Adam. Hi, Adam. Hi, Adam. Why do people have accents, and is there any biological reason that people develop them? So, I there's a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, one, accents are from, one, people being lazy mm -hmm. and, like, sloppy, being sloppy with their language and stuff. Of course. But also, um, with, it's, it's, it's because... When you have different groups of people, even like so, so there's always like ranges of accents, and they kind of like spread. So if like I, so ex example, if you have one accent, right? Mm -hmm. Let's. What's your accent? Say you're speaking a. Say so I've got a Texan accent. A Texan accent, and you have a British, British accent. accent. Yeah. I might like because I'm hearing both sides of you, on each side. I mm -hmm. might kind of start being kind of a, a British accent, since you're sitting, all. Since, That's since, your British accent, Since you're it? sitting closer to Sally, would it it's, be more British than Texan? Yeah, yeah. And so it's why, like, why does the Cockney come into it? I don't, well. Oh, I'm British now, I'm British. <laughs> you know, it's how all Americans do their British accents. That's not bad, but yeah. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not bad. bad. I'm a native Brit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so it's like I, I'm kind of getting a little bit of both, and so I I blend them because I'm in the middle. Also, another thing too is it could be a way th as a society that people talk similarly that you kind of learn your your clan, your group. So, um, so Sally, what's your uh, since Chris did such a terrible British accent? What's your American accent? Oh, I'm so bad at accents. Uh, let's see, it's because there's the Valley Girl. She's like, oh my god, like seriously, like everything so much vocal fry and like. I, so if we're talking about accents, like I cannot keep not bad, not bad. up. Can you, can you do a, a Texan accent? I feel like I feel no. like like you said Americans always go for like the Cockney accent, and Brits always go for like the Valley Girl. Well, but then you then there's the New York accent. It was it's I'm from New York. Hey, I'm walking here, and it's, it's always I was in New York, and I heard someone actually talking like this. I'm like, what? Someone actually talks like this? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know Texan though. Uh, the only because when I think Southern, I think like. To kill a mockingbird, like old Southern ballet. Get your ass up here, up all <laughs> hard at like, ya. <laughs> yeah, that's more like uh, like deep South, like Southeast exactly. United yeah, yeah. I, I find it very difficult to pick out the Texan accent. So though. before uh, we have Sally talk a little more about the biological reason, thankfully if I'm good. Accents, I'm better at I, science than I am at accents. I had a follow up question for Chris. How does laziness play into the development of accents? Because. Uh, you, everyone's always trying to find the easiest way to talk to each other and mm -hmm. the shortest way of talking to each other, and so different groups might like cut off certain words and like and 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 s simplify things. But they but because they're far away, and then it'll spread. But because they're far away, people might be cutting off words in different ways, and it spreads in little bubbles. Okay, and they don't spread widely like y'all versus <laughs> you use guys. Yeah. All right. Use guys. All right. Well, what 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 do, what do you think, Sally? Yeah, there's a lot of. Good stuff in there. So yeah. th with the laziness, it's, it's basically all the stuff about accents is very similar to the reasons that we have different species and speciation. It's you have groups of individuals that are separated and then random changes, what you would call laziness. So just <laughs> they just for whatever reason, they start talking in a certain way that's slightly different just because maybe that fits their own, like the physical structure of their vocal cords better or someone misheard something. So there's random changes that get picked up, but because they're always speaking within their own group, it gets amplified and continues. And so the the less social mobility you have, the more likely you are to get different accents. 
And this is the case, uh, you were talking as well about how it's kind of in-group, out-group thing. Not in so many words, but you were. <laughs> um, trust me, you were talking about in-group, out-group theory. Um, and yeah, it's often, it's interesting. So as a Brit coming to America, there are two routes I could take. Either I could start speaking in a slight English-American hybrid. So mm. I'm kind of assimilating into this accent. Or because, like I said, like you said, or yeah. because I'm surrounded by accents that are different to mine, my own accent becomes stronger, almost to kind of reinforce my own identity. Hmm. And so that's a huge thing. And, and just in case you're interested, the American accent is pretty much what the British accent was like in the 1600s. So they think that Shakespeare spoke most similarly to the American accent. And then all the Brits in the 1600s went over to America. Um, and your accent didn't change as much as ours did. So ours is the one that's changed a lot. The Victorians love to change everything. And so, yeah, so yours is kind of like an older accent. So than it's, ours. it's it's a side effect of communication over distance being more difficult back yes. then. It's like not until so recently. So people would live in the same street at the same time. I mean, so there are cities in the UK where you can literally tell which part of the city, like which side of the river, which street people are on by their accents. Like it's such a strong distinction. Is there a situation in the future where, like, say schools are done uh, through video and uh, VR tutorials where there's a uniform accent and it's distributed across large periods, like U.S. and stuff, and that kind of, like, standardizes or, like, not st not not eliminates accents, but kind of, like, lessens them? Well, people have always kind of proposed this universal language as well. But with accents, you, you're kind of getting it. I mean, already there are so many Americanisms in British English, for example, that people don't realize are Americanisms. And because we watch so much American media that it is kind of filtering in and languages are being lost all of the time. It's unlikely that you're going to get like one unified accent because school isn't the only place where people learn their accents. So yeah. it's a very common in British public schools, so the really posh Eaton Harrow, the ones where, oh, hello there, and we're going to talk <laughs> like this. So so the stuff that you hear on like the old BBC English, mm -hmm. that was because they were at boarding school. And so they spent all of their time with this very small group of people. So their accents become even more amplified. It's interesting, animals have accents too. So birds have city accents and country accents because they've got to have their, the point of singing is to have your voice heard as a communication. But the background noise in cities means that they have to have a higher pitch to get over the rumble of the cars. Hmm. And birds, I think they looked at it on birds next to motorways and they found that, on the weekdays, the birds would sing higher than at the weekends because they no longer had to fight against this noise. And sperm whales and uh, cows have also both been shown to have regional accents. So the cows up north sound different to yeah. the cows down south. And farmers notice this. The farmers notice that the cows were sounding different depending on what part of the country they were from. We don't need none of you city cows. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and the same with sperm whales because it's whenever you get animals communicating with each other but not every animal in the population is communicating. They're kind of clustering into groups. Huh. I, I never thought about animals, the possibility of animals having uh, their own accents. Yeah. It's a little frightening. All right. We have another question here. Why? And this one comes from Waffle Rain, which sounds delicious. Uh, Does it? Why? Yeah. Like, just be stepping in puddles of waffles. Yeah, with you your just... mouth open. Yeah, exactly. And just <laughs> if there are little falling. waffles, it'd be, think waffles like, the size of snow, snowflakes. Yeah. Okay, that would kind of be cute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, why are we basically the only animals that like spicy food? Well, I had this thought. Okay. What if we aren't? Mm. What if some animals do like spicy foods? But also, some also people, I think humans are just like like punishing themselves in a weird way. Um, and they like pain and they like, they like sensations. Things that just make them feel oh, alive. The crisp mm -hmm. flavors. Huh? Sens Sorry, Sensations is the name of a brand. Oh, yeah. Just like, and, and, and so, the, you know, the same way, like, um, when people, like, some people, when they're having sex, they like to get, like, slapped or choked or whatever. <laughs> same reason for that. Because people are just like sensations. Why is that where your brain went? It's always sex and poop <laughs> or butts. <laughs> So, um, so Sally, are we the only animal that likes spicy food? Spicy, bring it back to spicy foods. Yes, pretty much. It's it's really weird. So the spice in spicy food is caused by the compound capsaicin. 
and that's what's in um, pepper spray as well. And there's um, the Scoville scale of chili peppers as to how much capsaicin is in there. And the reason that it feels hot, even though the obviously the temperature of the pepper that you're eating isn't hot, is because it binds to the pain receptors on your tongue in the same way that menthol in mint binds to the cold receptors. So that makes your tongue feel cold. Oh. Um, and it's only mammals that can really taste capsaicin. Birds can't taste capsaicin. So birds can't even taste it, let alone like it. And one of the ways, if you've got squirrels on your bird feeder, one of the common um, things you're supposed to do is put pepper powder on your seeds so that the squirrels will hate the taste of it, um, but the birds can't taste it at all, so it won't put them off. Huh. Within the mammals, we are the only species that we know of that likes it. We're pretty much the only species that likes any, that actively seeks out pain. You can train like you other, said, Chris. you can train other animals to inflict pain on themselves, but that's very much through positive reinforcement. So if you injure, like if you give yourself an electric shock, we will reward you in some other way. Humans are the only ones that show what's called reverse hedonism, where we enjoy unpleasant sensations. And we don't really know why we do that, but we do. And no child is born enjoying the taste of chili. Yeah, I remember being a, a child and hating it. It's only in the last it. two years that I've been able to start eating ch spicy foods. Is that because as you get older, your taste buds like die off and become less potent? That's my theory. Partly, more of it is that you train yourself. So if you are, if you take a child, never give them spicy food, and as they age, their taste buds will be less strong. It's also why kids are fussier eaters because they can taste bitter chemicals more strongly than adults can. But also, if you were to take a child um, and feed them lots of spicy food, even as they were aging, they would also have that increased effect of getting used to having that spice. And so the signal from your tongue to your brain isn't as strong because the tongue's like, oh, okay, I've, done, I've seen this before, I know what's going on here. Calm. So you can build up your sense, um, reduce, sorry, your sensitivity to mm. capsaicin. Interesting, and uh, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, um, capsaicin exists in nature to prevent mammals from eating exactly. seeds so that birds can take the seeds and yeah. spread the seeds. So it's really important that if you're a plant that your seeds get distributed by something that's not going to just completely destroy the seeds and eating them. And so yeah, it's it's found mostly in kind of the membrane around the seed um, in order so that mammals don't eat it. But if you have eaten too much capsaicin as well, it's fat soluble. So drinking water will do nothing except move the molecule around your mouth. It needs to be. So the reason why you have milk or yogurt is because the fat in both milk and yogurt will dissolve the spice. I've tried uh, eating peanuts in the past and that seems to help as well. But well, I mean, there's a lot of oil in mm -hmm. peanuts. So yeah. So there's, there's your tip for the day. All right. Well, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. As always, if you have any additional questions, send them our way at sciencespot at roosterteeth.com. And we'll see you guys next time.